feels like. So I'm going to. Um, we are now reconvening uh, the uh, Thursday, February 28th, 2013 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. Uh, we just uh, reconvened from an executive session. Uh, we'll now move into the public comment period. Is there any uh, one from the public who wishes to speak? Seeing none, I will now move to the announcement uh, section. Are there any announcements um, from the school committee? Uh, I believe the superintendent had an announcement he wished to make. I am sad to make this announcement, but happy for our school committee clerk, Annie Thompson, who uh, I have accepted her resignation. She will be leaving us as of May 2nd, and I deeply appreciate the great work she has done for the past year and a half, and she will be missed and will be assisting me as we look for and train a replacement. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Amazing experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to move on to just one job now, then two, so, but it has been a great experience, so I do think it's Okay. Any other announcements? Okay. So we'll now move into the reports and recommendations phase and a discussion of the FY14 <coughs> budget. Thank you. Uh, we'll be handing out a packet of information and I will talk you through the highlights uh, and then we'll take some questions and have discussion. Are the mics on? Can you hear me? Oh, but, but the television audience can hear? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. I'd like to begin by talking you through the cover sheet. This is similar to the format that we used last year. And the top section is our allocation this year, total allocation in appropriations, grants, and other revolving accounts. That's $28,172,643. The next section are the budget needs or the increases to our budget. That is what will be creating the budget gap. And the third section are some of our suggestions, recommendations of how we're going to bridge that gap. And uh, hoping that together tonight, you can give me some advice and guidance to set the direction as we continue to build our draft budget uh, for the district for FY14. You can see our collective bargaining agreements. Uh, those are our obligations uh, to the negotiations that we've made at 727000 we factor in the teacher lane changes as they get degrees um, and also year advancements. Uh, we take each person, put them on the spreadsheet and move them up or over and so that is as close as we can be to an exact amount of what uh, the teachers who are moving at 37,000. Our special education support services, this is an amount to help support students who go out of district and um, though we may not need that total amount right now this is a as you know we built a budget this year with no reserves and therefore when a student does need an out-of-district placement it's something we usually can't predict and need to account for so that being our largest expenditure in special education we want to make sure that we have money to cover that going forward the others um, we're going into collective bargaining we need to have uh, fees for legal consultants. Uh, we are bidding our bus contract. That's our prediction of 95000 and what that will increase. Uh, we offset the athletics and the food service as uh, they are not quite self-supporting on the amount of $15,000. We need to purchase new AP biology books. As you know, we have cut our supply budgets, uh, so the high school doesn't have $5,000 to buy the AP biology books. For, these are required to run this course. The books can't be more than 10 years old, which ours will be next year. So really our choice is to stop teaching AP Biology or to purchase these books. And of course, we think that it's best for our students in our high school that we have those books. And so that 5,000 is in there. The technology van equipment use currently, our IT people uh, use their own vehicles to transfer equipment from building to building. 
Uh, we really don't think that this is good for the equipment. It's not. Uh, also feels that we're taking advantage of the people who are working for us, and we want to make sure that we support the moving of equipment. That $20,000 is an estimate of what we would pay to lease a vehicle, uh, rent a vehicle, or purchase a used vehicle so that we can ap appropriately move computer equipment around the district. And we will be seeing a reduction in our Medicaid funding of about $35,000. So if I look at those items, we're looking at uh, 1.2 million, uh, roughly, of budget increases or needs for our district for next year. And this is how, or this is our latest thinking of how we're going to get there. I've posed the idea to you recently of increasing a fee for kindergarten students. If we were to charge as much as $3,000, we can charge up to $4,000 for full day kindergarten. Uh, we take that number of $3,000, factor in the amount of students who would get uh, free uh, based on socioeconomic scale or reduced fee, and uh, we believe that we could bring in about $288,000 in revenue to help support our budget. We've discussed the idea of reducing busing to the high school. If we reduce just eliminate just those routes, we could save $47,000. We should do a uh, recommendation as an incremental fee in the food service for lunch prices and also the athletic fee. Uh, nominal fee would bring in 15000 for food service, about 10000 for athletics. We have a nature's classroom program in our elementary schools. That program is almost completely supported by the PTOs in each building. It's a great program. Families love, kids love, teachers love. It's a great experience for our kids. However, uh, some of those costs overrun uh, and overtime for ESPs, and that is paid for out of the district budget, about $4,000. Um, we feel we wouldn't want to cut that program in Nature's Classroom, but we would need to shift that cost, the full cost of the program, over to the PTOs so it's not coming out of our budget. Although we're going to have some retirements, uh, about 25 people, and that's not just teachers, it's teachers, ESPs, custodians, clerical, and administration. Um, there really nets out uh, zero savings from retirements. Once we pay out the retirement benefits and uh, rehire the position, last year we actually, I believe we had six retirements and we lost, uh, the net result was minus $1,100, so we didn't even come to zero. But sometimes people say, oh, we're having that many retirements, there should be some savings, so I wanted to point that out, that, that, that does, it's not always realized in our budget. This next item I want to be very specific about, and this is Title I funding, um, and that goes to JFK. Okay. We may lose that funding next year. It looks, it looks like we're going to lose that funding. That funding supports three reading teachers at JFK, so we would lose the amount of money of 133000 That doesn't mean that we would choose to cut those reading teachers in Title I. We may have to cut staff in the amount of 133000 in order to absorb those teachers. That would be a principal decision. And so uh, Leslie and her faculty would decide what they wanted to do. But I listed it that way because that is the grant we will be losing, not necessarily the people we will be losing. So in addition to that, even if we do those unsavory things uh, up to this point, we still need to reduce the equivalent of 14 full-time equivalent teachers. Uh, the way that I would break it out is that we do eight from regular education, six from special education. The way that looks uh, would be the equivalent of $400,000 in regular education teaching and $300,000 in special education. Uh, this is just a draft here of how that would be broken out. It may be four teachers from the elementary. I put zero for middle school because they'll already be absorbing the cut of three full-time teachers due to that grant reduction and four FTEs at the high school. In special education, you can see that we have that broken out that mostly it would be at the elementary. And again, that may not be teachers, it may be ESPs or a combination of, just so we reach the dollar amount of the equivalent of four FTEs at the middle school too. And the high school and special education, actually we're gonna to try to budget in a slight increase because um, they need more support and more staffing at the high school. Let me pause there for a minute before I take you through the rest of the packet and see if there are questions. Uh, 
or comments so far, and then I can talk you through the rest of the material I have here. Any questions? Or? I have a question. You said a slight increase for um, the special education at the high school. Is that um, in the second of budget needs or increases? That's not the SPED support services for 250,000, um, is it? That, that may be part of that funds. Um, we're not sure exactly how much it would be, but it would be absorbed within this budget. It wouldn't be a new increase on top of that amount. So it's not, it is including the 250? It would be within that 250. Okay, right. but not the 250. But not the 250. Okay, no. thank you. Um, I spoke to I spoke to Mark right beforehand, and, I, and, and my understanding is that a lot of these estimates, uh, particularly in the, um, the budget recommendations to reduce the gap, are preliminary estimates. That there's probably still some more figuring to do to find out what the real number or a better estimate would be. Right. Is that correct? Each time we draft the budget, which is uh, every day, because those of you who met with us last night recognize some changes from last night to today and we do redraft this every day and it gets finer and finer detail each time um, and as you can see even if we were to do all these things at the bottom of the page we still have a seventy seven thousand dollar gap but we didn't want to overshoot the gap we want to uh, continue to draft it to fine-tune the numbers before we make any further cuts yeah I, I just think it would be really <coughs> helpful if as you do that you keep a record of it so that um, because I know people ask questions like, is that really true about all these numbers? Mm -hmm. You know, and if, um, if, if, if it could be, and people say, well, did, did you think about this particular plus mm -hmm. or minus that should go into that number? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I don't know by looking at this number. So it would be really right. good if we could, if, if at some point the document included a page that showed the equation that led to that number so that people could look at it and say, okay, they thought of everything I've thought of. Okay. That'd be, I think, useful. Um, um, also, we have a joint budget and property with the school councils next Tuesday the 5th, mm -hmm. and yet this is coming out. Do you think that the, with hearing from the school councils that we're going to be changing any of this? I, I just feel like we're listening to it, and yet right. we haven't heard from the school right. councils so That's yet. what happens in this budget season, and that's what happened last year as well. Okay. When we go to the school councils, we get new ideas, new suggestions, make changes, and as I said, every day this will change until we do the final proposed budget that that book that details every last dollar in the district that you will get um, by the end of March, beginning of April, right? One more month. Mr. Meyer? I just have a question. If, um, if we could see the calculation, or you could explain how the calculations were done for the $288,000, given that mm -hmm. it's a sliding scale based on income, mm -hmm. based on state median income, and do we, was that did we guesstimate as to what the income levels were of the parents sending kids to kindergarten? Right, because we only, we, these kindergartners are kids we haven't seen before. Right. Uh, so we go on the average of how many were, how many were, um, are on free or reduced lunch now, and then factor that average in to next year's kids, assuming that it would be about the same. Yeah. And is, was there any, I guess when I was looking at the regulations, it's, it's not area median income that's the key for the sliding scale. It's actually state median income, which there's might a state affect. scale is published on the DESE website right. that w website that we if we charge for kindergarten we have to follow that right. scale. Right. And I guess the uh, a number that I was just given by Barbara Black uh, from preschool that out of 36 preschool kids, only six of them would be full pay if they were to come to kindergarten. But of course, that's a small segment of the population right. of kindergarten predicted to be 192. I mean, just my, because my concern is that if, if we're, this step were to happen, that we really get the revenue. Because I think before, last, the last thing, the situation in this vein came to mind with changing busing fees. Mm -hmm. And there was a projection of revenue which didn't occur because mm -hmm. people switched. Right. And so, you know, we, I think it's, we need to think carefully about what revenue would be, rec would be realized. Um, based on both the sliding scale being applied and also people opting for other alternatives, going to another district, right. mm -hmm. staying at home. Right. Important point. Yes. Well, and also to follow up with uh, Mr. Meyer, would also be the transportation. It would be my question of getting the kids to kindergarten would be then adding another bus route to take them home if they are going home and since they fall in the state mandate. So would that change our bus 
estimation quite a bit. It would, uh, it would depend on how many families opted for half day versus full day. And then if it would be you know, a small number and you could do it with a van versus a large number, you'd have to do it with a bus. Uh, that would all have to, be, we have to wait and see as far as registration goes. That's why this is a very conservative estimate. Okay. Th then I do also have another question. Um, in the budget needs are increases. We have the athletic services offset increase of 15000 And then we also have down in the third category the recommendations to reduce the gap. We have the 15000 or the 10000 down there. Mm -hmm. So, yet with the food service, we have 15,000, we have 15,000 mm -hmm. on the bottom too. Um, we didn't want to go all the way to, to balance it with, with athletics, and how many kids does that represent, or is that why? Because it would put too much stress on just those kids. It's a good question. Uh, I, you've heard me speak before that I don't like increasing fees on families at all. Uh, I think families pay enough uh, for lunch and for athletics. Uh, however, we're at this situation where we have to do something. And our goal in building this budget was to keep the cuts away from the classroom as much as possible, to try to do some, try, try to follow through on some other ideas to preserve the teachers in the classroom. To answer your question, the food service lunch price increase, uh, if we had to increase these fees, I would want to do it in a nominal amount. If you increase the lunch prices, um, you remember that's all 2,700 kids in the district. So you've got a larger pool of people who are paying the extra 25 cents a day. Okay, uh, With athletics, that's really just the high school, and it's a small number of kids. So we want to increase it a nominal amount, but we won't generate that much revenue because of the smaller number of people who would actually pay the increase in fee. Hmm. Other comments or questions? All right, I'll walk you through the pack a little bit more and I'm sure more questions will arise. <coughs> On the next sheet, you'll see projected enrollment for next year and you may be wondering, well, what if we had to cut those four regular education FTEs at the elementary school, what would that mean? And so we took the three lowest grade levels in enrollment for next year, which is second grade at Leeds, fourth and fifth grade at Jackson Street. Currently, those three grades in gray there are three classrooms. If we were to take three classrooms and merge them into two classrooms, you would see class size of 27 in the two, in the two grades at Leeds. You'd see 26 and 27 at Jackson Street. Uh, I wanted to point that out as an impact of reducing FTEs at the elementary. That's only three. That's not the whole four that we have talked about. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the sections, which is the average student <laughs> in the class. At 58 sections, you have 19 and a half students per class. <laughs> if we reduce by only three sections uh, to 55, you'd be at 20 and a half students per class. Now, when you look at averages, you say, well, that's not so bad. We'll go from 19 and a half kids to 20 and a half kids. However, if you're the family with a kid in fourth and a kid in fifth at Jackson, you're saying, but both of my kids are in classes of 27. And uh, that, that's a real impact to those families and to those kids. So I wanted to make sure that I pointed that out as transparently as possible of what it would mean if we do these reductions. Uh, JFK, we factor in an increase in enrollment in seventh grade because kids come from private schools and charter schools. Um, Leslie Wilson has commented that that number may be larger next year, that it looks like there may be more families who are coming. So again, that is a conservative estimate. At the high school, that extra 25 is factored in as kids who come from private schools and charter schools, and that number is factored in after we factor out the number of kids who will go to Smith Folk. Um, we usually, if that number we're predicting would be 40 for next year, uh, we factor them out. We factor 65 kids in, so that would be an increase of 25 at the ninth grade. That's how. That's where that number came from. If you flip again, you'll see the FTEs or the full-time equivalencies by location. The column on the left, you see central office, special education, district-wide programs, each of the elementary is the middle school and the high school. Across the top is administrators, unit B, non-represented employees, those are who are not in a union, teachers, clerical custodians, educational support personnel, and food service. So that's our total number of people. And I think, I think that's an important number for you to look at. We flip over. 
that's uh, that's this current year snapshot, right? The FY year thirteen. Snapshot with known changes that have happened. Right. They might go up and down in the year, but yes. Right. The uh, next sheet you'll see is the compar comparison of the appropriation budget over the years, the past 12 years, and you can see how the appropriation has grown, um, and you see the past three years, um, three years ago there was an increase of 638,000, that was I believe the final year of the era, <coughs> the era funds, and now last year was an increase of 208, this year an increase of $69,000. So I wanted you to see that pattern in history. If you flip one more time, you'll see how we compare, and this is a suggestion that came from last night from Budget and Property. Uh, what's our average cost per pupil, and how does that break out? Uh, percentage spent on administration, you see 4.2%. Percentage on teachers at 51.3%. Professional development and so forth across. We took that and compared it to some schools in the area as you can see, um, we fall in the bottom middle or the middle of our average cost per pupil and our administrative costs and our teacher percentage. I think that's an important number so people see the percentage of our budget that's spent on personnel. Um, often there'll be questions, you know, are we top heavy in administration, are we not? And this chart serves to answer those questions for you. The per pupil expenditure at the bottom of this sheet is the past seven years of the school district per pupil expenditure, which you can see has been below the state average for the past seven years. And we wanted to point that out as well. That takes you through all the information um, that I have for you tonight. I wanted you to see some of the thinking, some of the factoring in as we build this budget. And again tonight, I would like to hear your discussion and have your guidance on what direction you would like us to go in building this. I know there may be some of you who don't want us to increase fees at all, and you know we're open to doing that. Just keep in mind this is a zero-sum game, so if we decide not to go in that direction, we will have to increase the number of people that we have to cut from our payroll. Uh, right now, if you add it up, in the FTE total reductions, again, six in special education, the equivalent of eight in regular education, and the equivalent of three because of the grant reduction at JFK. We're looking at at least 17, uh, the equivalent of 17 full-time teaching positions we'll have to cut from our budget for next year. One final comment, what that means in impact to families is increase in class size, uh, not everywhere, but in some areas to uh, an uncomfortable level and also a decrease in some elective choices uh, because we can't keep all of our offerings and just merge the classes together make bigger classes there will be a combination of some classes um, that have less demand that we would have to stop offering and try to increase the size of other classes and now I'll pause for your comments and questions I understand that uh, getting rid of any fees or, or not instituting fees does result in <coughs> greater losses. Uh, but one thing that was really big when I first entered education was this push. When I came in, lots of schools are still doing half-day kindergarten, and there's been a lot of push to for full day for lots of reasons. Uh, what research shows and how beneficial it is, and we know with the demands on kids these days, um, with accountability that early education is is critical. Uh, we, we would love it if all students could have access to really high quality preschool as well. Um, but if we can't do that, at least we had full day kindergarten for everyone. And when we do something like this, what ends up happening is there are people who, who can't afford it and they, or who are in free and reduced lunch and they're covered and there are people who can't afford it and they, they get it. And then there's this middle group of working families that are struggling and they're, they're, and the issue is that they're often the families that are very busy working and trying to manage a lot of um, time um, away from the family, trying to cover things. And then um, if they can't afford it, then these kids are getting half day kindergarten, not getting the same level of education as their peers. 
and may not even be able to have the same support at home because families are very busy. And what ends up happening is right from kindergarten, you start this path where there's a discrepancy, and that doesn't go away. And I see it as a sec years of second teaching second grade. Um, you could tell students that didn't have, uh, we, I would often get, um, not often, but occasionally get students who hadn't had a, uh, a full day kindergarten experience, they transferred into the district, um, or they didn't have kindergarten at all. And without even looking at the file, you could tell. You could see those, those things stay, and it's very hard to make up that ground once you lose it. And, and I, it's, it's messy, I understand that, but I, I would just caution us, or I would at least hope that we would have a long look at what is the long-term impact of instituting this. And I know the, if we say, okay, we're not going to touch kindergarten, we're going to leave it, then we look at really drastic effects with FTEs in, in the other areas. But um, I could go on and on about other things about kindergarten, but for now I just want to say that's, and I know you're well aware of that, so I'm not saying things you don't know, but I guess more for the public and just to put out to the committee that this is a, a move like this it creates an equity that is really hard to, to fix um, for that cohort. So if we only do it one year, that one cohort is affected Permanent, like that's a that's a really tough thing to, to get back, and these are our youngest kids. So, do we know how many districts statewide are doing? I mean, or have done this? Are charging for kindergarten? Yeah. yeah, I don't have the number on top of my head, but it is on the DESE website, and we could get that. Is it, I mean, is it fairly yeah. common or fairly unusual, or is it kind of hard to say? There's a mix. Some yeah. still offer free, some charge for full days, some yeah. charge for the second. Uh, range of what it is, but I can get you a number. I can okay. Actually, as we looked at the demographic data, as we were putting this together, you know, as typical, the eastern half of the state has it's more common to charge right. for kindergarten, and in middle and western mass, it does happen, but it's less common. Uh -huh. Right. Are there any in western mass? Yes. Yes. Mark, do you remember off the top of your head? Was it I, I didn't hear the question. How many, uh, which ones in Western Mass? There are some in, uh, in the Pioneer Valley who are charging for kindergarten. Was it Longmeadow or East Longmeadow? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the, the names yeah, of the I'd hate to guess. Whoever <laughs> knows. So, yeah. I, have, I have year old data, which was that 35 districts out of 393 charge for full day kindergarten. So, nine percent. This is from two, January of 2012. So it's a year old. So with the recession, it may have changed. But um, excuse me for saying so, but I don't really care how many districts are doing it because I think it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I'm feeling so heartbroken tonight. Sorry, I'm a little emotional about this one. Um, Barbara's going to remember that I was in, um, I was one of the parents in the first year that we had full day kindergarten for kids. My son was in that class. And there was a group of parents that fought so hard for that. Remember, Barbara? Um, and I just, I, I find it so heartbreaking that we have to look at this in our budget. So, on the one hand, I want to, you know, commend you and, and, um, the members of ALT who have been working on this and, and trying to make the best decisions to, to, to present to us as possible. And I mean, obviously none of these are palatable. And I just, I mean, this is my, this is my 12th bu budget season. And, you know, I was really hoping that my last one was going to be better than the others. And it, it's not, this is worse. It just, it just gets worse and worse every year. And I just, I go back and forth between being heartbroken and being really angry because I think we have, not Northampton, in, in this country, I think we have such a broken system. And I, I deal with this in my work life in healthcare and I deal with it here in education and we are just so broken that we're forced into making decisions that are so unpalatable, that are so not the decisions that we think that we need to be making for our students and for our staff. and. Um, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I just, I can't even put words to how um, distressing I find it. And I know that we, I know we all do. Um, the whole kindergarten question is just, it feels so untenable to me because it does sit, set up such inequity in our, in our district. And we have, um, in terms of socioeconomics, we're a pretty diverse town, Nick City. 
and I just feel like this doesn't address those issues at all. As, as Mike said, there's this, you know, there's the, the group in the middle, I think that's probably the biggest, mm -hmm. the biggest group there. And I just, there's, there's no way of making that right for those parents. You know, none, none of these seem right to me, but again, when you're talking about increasing, you know, lunch costs across the district for a little bit, so either people are gonna pay that or more kids are gonna be bringing their lunch to school and we're not gonna see that difference. And, um, you know, I don't like athletic fees, but I feel like we've, we've done it as responsibly as we know how, and I know that we offer waivers as best we can. Um, and some of these things, I mean, it, it just starts to feel Petty, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful or diminishing way that we you know, like we have to take this $4,000 away from Nature's Classroom, which we know is such a fabulous program in our schools, and burden our PTOs just even even more to be able to cover that when they're already working so hard for us. Um, and I, you know, I look at the class sizes, and, and this is, um, you know, this is February, and we know that numbers climb over the course of the spring and into the summer, and you know, so if you have a, a class with 27 kids in it now and we have people moving into the district, what happens? And where do we get the money for that extra teacher? Because we're not going to, you know, what number are we going to say we can't go to? We're, are we going to say we can't go to 30? I hope so. Um, and I just, I mean, I'm not offering any, any solutions here. I'm just, I'm just um, stating my, my global distress about the whole situation. But uh, of all the cuts that we're looking at, the one that I find most untenable is the idea of um, taking away full day kindergarten because um, you know we work so hard to get it in and I haven't seen that we've been able to replace much that we've taken away in the last 12 years. And um, you know, if that's what we take away this year, what, you know, what in God's name are we taking away next year? I mean, I just, I just don't know where we go in our thinking with that. Um, so again, that's not a solution. It's not even you know the beginning of an idea to look at. It's just just a commentary. Mr. Ball. Well, um, I agree. I mean, I agree that kindergarten is, is should not be touched. Um, have we looked at other possibilities, such as consolidating the grades in the schools together, like um, other districts may have done, like K one, two, or K one? Um, and then two, three, and four, five, so that we can divide the teachers out in a different way and maybe not have such a hit? I mean, have we looked at outside of the box that way? Because um, I think it would be real, really remiss of us to, to do that to our community, to take away kindergarten from whomever. We don't know. I mean, some of the, it will be some of the, the lower socioeconomic people that are going to have a difficult time and won't necessarily jump on it because it's free or reduced. Mm -hmm. There will be the middle class also. And then it sets up a whole problem of, of um, we've already had the problem right now in, in preschool of seeing the, the kids who haven't had preschool experience coming into kindergarten and having our kindergartens have to teach from that level. We're now going to be pushing that out to first grade to to try to get everybody to have that, that equal balance of education. And I totally agree with Mike that, it, it, that that marks them for the rest of their entire career as far as a student. And also, whether or not they're going to like school and, and how they connect to school, based on some kids going a full day, some kids going a half day. I mean, there's just that, you know, the kids that leave, that kind of social stigma. I just think there's a lot of things that could be considered um, maybe differently, if we could think of it like way differently. Suggestion. Uh, I'd like to respond to that because yes, we did have that discussion. And what is important in this discussion is that these are pretty drastic cuts that we need to make to make this year's budget work. You can predict that this will be the same next year and the same three years from now. And so it is important that we look at those kinds of shifts. And we talked about the idea of grouping grade levels to get the economy of size. And maybe two of our elementary schools would be K1 and 2, and the other two elementary schools would be 3, 4, and 5. But that is something that we would need to put out there as an idea, discuss the ramifications with families, and have public forums on it and talk with families about it. That's not an idea we felt we could put on the table this year and have done by the end of March which is when this budget has to be submitted. But yes, that has been a part of our alt discussions, that that is something we'll need to consider doing for year two and year three uh, going forward. 
keep in mind that we factored in a very minimal amount of money for our collective bargaining uh, negotiations uh, for the first year. We're going to begin our negotiations in the next month or so, and that again is a three-year contract. So to if we expect our teachers to ratify a contract with a minimal uh, raise that we're building into this budget, we're going to need to have something in year two or year three in order to make it a satisfactory contract for our teachers so that they will ratify it. And if we're going to do that, again, as I mentioned, we'll be looking at 800000 to a $1 million cuts over the next um, two years. And we'll have, to, we'll have to go to some of those ideas you've just suggested. Okay, I wanted to follow up on one other thing, is not just to leave it exclusively at the high school, I mean at the um, kindergarten, but to go on to the high school as an issue for a second. That my concern also there is that the kids that do need those buses are kids that really do need those buses. And they may be of a economic level at which it's it would place a burden where they may not even be able to get to school. I, I'm just concerned about some of, you know, the um, just socioeconomics. I really think that Northampton does has a lot of has and a lot of have nots, and and I don't. I think that we as a community need to make sure that we try to maintain unity with a sense of equity. One more comment about, um, for now. One more comment about the um, about the kindergarten is that uh, is there research that sh shows, or is this something that you've discussed at all, that if we have children who aren't in full day kindergarten, isn't that going to increase our special ed costs the following years for those kids? Um, I don't know. It are would not seem going to be um, getting that some of their classmates might yeah. be getting. It would seem logical. I don't know the that research has pointed out that empirically, but we all agree the full day kindergarten has benefits that last throughout the child's education. So that's not, we don't want to reduce kindergarten to half day. Um, that, that could end up being one of the budget cuts we have to go to if we can't charge for kindergarten full day and we can no longer afford to pay the teachers to be there for a full day. We may have to have everybody go to a half day. That wouldn't be something I'd want to do right now, but again, that might be year two and year three of are building our budget uh, because I, I really, you know, I don't want some kids to have full day and some kids not to. And let, let me ask this question, and I'm saying this without having given it a, a lot of thought, and I don't have the information. M my my memory is 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 my memory correct that kindergarten in itself is not mandatory? All right, half day we need to provide. We have to provide. Yeah. Half day is mandatory. Okay, because my my question was. Um, Going, and was going to be, and would the, if we had to look at fees for kindergarten, would, what you're, what you're proposing is charging for the, the second half of the day, would we be able to charge families a lesser amount if we charged for a full day, but we're not allowed to do that because we have, have to provide, to provide the first half yeah. of the day? All right, just to clarify that, as a school district, we have to provide half day kindergarten. But using the word mandatory or not for a family, kindergarten is not mandatory. Right. Right. Most people <laughs> choose kindergarten, and we recommend that they do. Are we, right. are we disallowed from charging for the first half of the day? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what yes. I was trying to find out. Okay. I have to follow up with Stephanie. Um, she was talking about the special needs. Um, if, if we don't have the, the full day kindergarten, then obviously the teachers will have less time in front of the kids. And would we want to do more aggressive testing of kids in kindergarten to determine if they have special needs, I mean, earlier so we can catch it earlier? Because now they'd be, be maybe being caught in kindergarten, hopefully in preschool some are caught, but I mean, would we be able, would we want to test? We uh, test kids for disabilities when they're referred for disabilities, and then we have, uh, we have some steps that we take to try to support the student before they go into the special education program. Uh, so we wouldn't do a blanket testing of students, no. So then we, then theoretically, we might not notice until kindergarten. I mean, we, well into kindergarten. Then there are some students so whose disabilities don't surface until ninth or tenth grade when they are very first tested. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Pick. Um, 
the other thing, in, in just going back in my memory, and, and I'm not, I don't want to put her on the spot, but Barbara's going to have a better memory for this than I do. Um, when we were working on this kindergarten issue, um, let's see if my son was, would have been about 15, 16 years ago, um, there was a group of parents that came forward and offered to um, pay for teaching staff so that we could have the full day be there for everybody. And that was a very difficult, contentious thing for school committee. And I, what I remember is that they agreed to it and then it, the pe people were reimbursed and the school committee found a way to fund it. But my guess is, is that if we move forward with this, so there's, there are going to be parents who come forward and say that they want to um, help pay for that. And I think that we're going to need to have a policy in place and, and have that clearly understood how we would respond to that before it happens so that we don't have the mess that we had all those years ago. Right, well, just offhand, okay. how we would respond to say. donations would hopefully be consistent with how we've responded to donations recently. Any donation is made to the school committee and accepted into the general fund for us to decide how to distribute. You know, so unless there was some special rule of accepting donations from parents, we'd want to leave it at that. And back. <laughs> Another question for you. Um, okay, going back into grade four and five at Jackson Street and grades two at Leeds, where there's 54 and 53 and 54 kids, mm -hmm. respectively. Um, would And I understand the ramifications that further on down the road, if we increase the school of choice kids, then it's going to hit JFK and, and the high school, et cetera. But would it be possible to increase this, this, the school of choice slots there and get another teacher in so that all of them, instead of 27 and 26, had maybe 21. Each, each class would have 21 and, and increase the classroom. And I know we'd be adding a teacher, but hopefully we'd have that number of school of choice to, mm -hmm. of students to hopefully cut I think on. that's an important question that you're asking. I touched on it last month, but I think it's worth repeating that we did open up more seats in school choice this year and we did max out our applications so people who applied for seats uh, got them we also had seats that stayed open because we didn't have enough applicants so it's i believe that we've we've brought in as many students through school choice as we're going to be able to uh, we don't have people on a waiting list for school choice if they wanted to be here they were in with the exception of only one uh, grade level that was just too full uh, that was fifth. Um, I would have to go back. And oh, check okay. The data. Yeah. And, and are we doing school of choice for next year? Or is that of course? Okay. Um, no, I mean, when when is that going to be? It's when open now. Oh, it's open now. Mm -hmm. And do you know how many slots there are? Do, we haven't seen any of that. No, I haven't I seen haven't any of that. I haven't presented that yet. Oh, okay. Right. But that comes later on in the process, so we won't know for the. Well, I believe it counted in the there budget. would be very little change to school okay. choice. Of course, the change that could come for school choice is, you know, given our budget constraints, the class is going to be large. There may be more people who apply for school choice out. Um, but I, I do believe that our school choice, and I, I presented that last month. You had the chart. I think going through, I mean, we, can, we can look at this budget. We, we know a lot of us feel very strongly about the kindergarten issue here but there's there's a lot of issues on the table here we but we know it's all bad there's no way we can shuffle money around in here with we've done this enough years to know that the budget's that tight um, I mean the solution to this is is not at least on our end right now not trying to identify more and more cost savings that we can strip out of this budget but thinking about revenue sources and that's um, you know I think think something we need to start paying attention to and it may be that um, you know that that I mean not to throw the word override out, but I mean they're they're going to be. We need revenue, and this is a revenue issue. This is this has always been a revenue issue uh, for us. We don't bring in enough money to fully fund the edu uh, education in this community the way um, we should, or the way we want to. And um, and I know there's groups already in the city working on this and working on it at the state level, the national level, um, and local level, but. Uh, I think that's if we're going to try to get ourselves out of this bind, we start. We need to start looking at that end of it, and rather than sit through the budget and trying to find, well, if I pull this from here and I raise this here, um, I don't know the solution, but I just feel like that's we'll get more return for our efforts working on that end than on um, trying to strip from this budget. Anymore than anybody else. Are we allowed to charge like a materials fee to students? 
um, for like art supplies and things like that? Books. Um, book fees. Mark, do you know the answer to that? A certain amount of that has to be included. Uh, if it's something that's extraordinary, uh, that's out of the normal range, uh, I think we have a case to charge it if it's outside of a normal range of... You can't just sell like a materials fee at a certain amount to raise revenue? Ooh, um, I think there's an expectation uh -huh. um, that's there. I um, have not seen it done before, uh -huh. um, so I, I have no proof for any case to, to say, say that it's been done. 300 bucks a kid, that's what it would be. That's what it is, right? That's 300. Yeah, for to close an $800,000 gap, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Um, I just want to echo, Downey said it earlier, and I think it's important, as I'm sitting here thinking about the fee for kindergarten, which I know we don't, we don't want. But my, my concern is that that number that we have here, we. Guess, right? Yeah, it's just a guess, and if it doesn't, I like to call it an estimate, not okay, a guess, an estimate, but uh, yes, estimate, and it's a conservative estimate. Yeah, I, I'm just, yeah, I just think, all right, well, if there are people who uh, they choice out or they uh, they decide to not send the child to kindergarten, they go to preschool for another year. You know, what is that going to do to that number? And then all of a sudden, we got to cut other things out as well. So I guess I know you will probably do it, but I feel the need to say this: if we could zero in a little bit more on that number. I feel a little more comfortable. Well, I think the direction I need from school committee tonight is whether w we as a team should continue building this budget, factoring in a fee for kindergarten or not. I mean, I'm not hearing anybody think that the kindergarten fee is a good idea, and I agree. So if you want us in our next draft tomorrow morning of the budget uh, to not include a kindergarten fee, that is a, a step we can take. Just a, just a few things. One would be that uh, when, we sat, when we sat with the all team uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a discussion about keeping the cuts away from uh, the classroom teachers. Um, all the things that we discussed, uh, the superintendent has put on this. So the kindergarten fee came out of the idea of keeping cuts away from full-time positions, uh, the bus reduction, all of them all these things and if we tally them all up right now um, they still don't make up the lion's share of what needs to be uh, cut in order to balance the budget it's uh, on the backs of our teachers already at seven hundred thousand plus um, when we remove the kindergarten fee and move that close to three hundred thousand dollar number out of there i'm not seeing anywhere else you can go other than to the bottom two lines where it's full-time teachers and so uh, if we were to look at the numbers again um, throughout the district and any more numbers that uh, needed to grow in the uh, elementary schools we would consider we would continue to see those classroom sizes um, in the 27 28 the, the ones that are tough to look at right now on three lines are going to now look on six seven and eight lines and uh, as unpalatable as it is to look at the three in the, the shaded area that shaded area is going to get a lot more on these pages I'm afraid um, and it's going to take the burden off of um, in the idea of not having um, uh, you know the, the kindergarten and making sure all our kids are here for a full day, full day kindergarten and I couldn't agree more that uh, uh, a great start in uh, kindergarten is paramount for and sets the tone for your entire educational experience. Um, but I've oftentimes heard uh, myself included, Mr. Flynn and others, speak about missing that one year within your school experience and never getting that back too. And so when we sat here and debated the idea of um, whether or not uh, we were going to add or subtract an elementary school uh, teacher and create a very large class size and we talked about the detrimental effects of that student we talked about tracking that student until graduation and we spoke about the gap that existed that followed him or her through graduation and so um, you know maybe if we stem it 
in kindergarten and get that student going to third grade while well, that gap is prolonged or that negative impact is prolonged for a few years but it, eventually it catches up with that student somewhere along the line and um, I, I don't know how that factors in but it's a, it's a thought that I've had and, and I've heard many times over and again like we've all said we're just it's the, it's we just got the shells and we're moving it around where do we want it uh, to, to hurt in which area and it hurts everywhere so we're looking for the less hurt the less impact and it, it's just it's not here um, on this table and um, I'm not coming out and supporting or endorsing anything but I think Mr. Flynn has a very valid point that this is a revenue stream problem um, we, we continue to strive to get back to levels that were funded uh, you know a decade ago coming out of the state and those those numbers uh, and the, the funding and the help that we received so long ago just cannot continue to uh, to get caught up to where we we need it right now uh, and until that happens um, this is never going to to fix itself and I, I, I'm pleased that the superintendent is looking at this as a two and a three year uh, situation and planning out because what we've learned over time is certainly um, something that we were naive of uh, a few years ago, which was things are going to get better. And we heard the, the state and we heard the information come out, which was um, this is it, you know, things are turning around and next year will be better. And we inched in and inched in with everything that we had. And we finally pushed everything to the middle saying, because this is the last year it's going to be so bad, we're going to play all our cards and next year we'll start to build it back out. Well, the hand was a bust and it will continue to be a bust until we look at ways in which we can uh, really fix the problem. And the only solution is to find ways to bring uh, dollars into, into the district and into um, our budget to support what we all know is a sound educational um, experience for every single student so oh, and let's quickly put some numbers to what Ed said yeah, go ahead. Too. so uh, on this draft you're looking at uh, 17 the equivalent of 17 teaching positions that would need to be cut in addition to these other things if for example we take the kindergarten fee off the table that would be an additional the equivalent of six FTEs you'd be at 23 teachers um, positions will be cut. If you look at the third page in your handout, the total number of teachers in the district is 234. So you're talking about a cut of 10% of your total teaching staff district wide. Over to you all, sorry. Oh uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, um, I know that, I mean, I, I don't like the idea of, um, you know, changing kindergarten that way either, but I, I'm a little hesitant to say, don't touch kindergarten unless I'm going to say, then go ahead and cut six teachers to the elementary school. I mean, it's, like you said, it's a zero-sum game. And I think it would be helpful for us to hear a little bit about, I mean, you had the uh, elementary principals in the room. How did you how did you all come to the conclusion that this was uh, the, the way to go, I guess? Well, the first thing we did when we were given our level funding number is we did the simple math that you did, that this is $300 per student. We divided that up by the six buildings and said, what would this mean to each building? And that was a pretty grim scenario. So then we started to think, let's not just think about cutting, let's think about alternatives of bringing some revenue in to help ameliorate the pain of these cuts. And that's how we came up with these other ideas. Uh, because the, the total cut of the $800,000 for level services is just too great for us to really imagine. Thanks. First one is about kindergarten. Um, how many school choice kids did we have coming into kindergarten this year? Do you happen to know that number? Approximately. I have a hard time hearing you with this. Okay. I'm wondering how many school choice kids we'd have typically coming into kindergarten in any given year. Uh, we don't have that number. I don't have it, but I know I have it back in the office. But we do have kids choicing in, in kindergarten pretty regularly. But I don't know what the number so, is. But, so my 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 thought about that is, is are we going to end up losing school choice revenue because of kids who won't choice in for kindergarten it could be the 
the number 3,000 uh, for tuition for full day kindergarten seems like a big number. I agree, that's a lot of money out of an annual salary. If you take that and divide it by 10 months, you're looking at 300, and you divide that by four weeks, you're looking at $75 a week. Five days, you're looking at $15 a day uh, for afternoon educational childcare. When you break it down that way, it's a little more palatable, but that's still not a lot, not easy for our families to take. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I totally understand mm -hmm. that. And if their alternative is to find childcare or whatever, it may cost them the same amount, if not more. Or unless they have somebody who's just going to stay home with the kids and they're just not going to get that experience. But, you know, it, it's like you know, an addition here and an increase on their deductible and health insurance and this and this and that. And everything is, you know, it all adds up to real money. Of course. Um, so that was one thought. And then the other thing is just. Just looking at um, the sheet you have with the comparison on the appropriation budget, and so in these 12 years, we've had a, a loss of 141 students, next to a loss of 36.6 teachers, and that, that just doesn't that just doesn't match up very well in terms of. You know, I don't quite understand how the ratio doesn't look different than that, but I mean that's just it's just so so much. Um, but my other question was, um, we haven't really talked, and you might not know the details on this because it might just be more of a generalized thing right now, about on these staff reductions, um, what is it? what does it actually mean or do we know that yet to lose four FTEs at the high school? Are we talking about a program? Are we talking about larger classrooms? Do, do we know what we're talking about? And um, I mean, I think that we know, we can see what, what, it, what it means at the um, at the elementary schools, and you, you've showed us three, um, but you're actually cutting four, so mm -hmm. I mean, it seems pretty clear kind of where it's going to go, and we're going to be looking at 30 kids in, in a class if we go to that fourth Quite possible. That fourth one, because we're, you have to look at the, cl the, the grades where there are three sections, and if there are three sections of 20 and you cut that to two, that's 30 kids in a class. Um, so that's where we are with elementary. You said none at the middle school, four at the high school. I don't know what that means, and I, I don't. Didn't I didn't say none at the middle school. Remember the. I, I don't right. know right. additional com important after the. Yes, right. I understand. Yeah. So, do we know what that looks like in terms of staffing, at middle school and high school, and what does it mean to be losing this number of special ed FTEs at the at the various levels? That's a lot of questions. Sorry. That's big. Uh, let me <laughs> let me decide where to begin there. Uh, so because this is a draft, we don't work all the way down to the details of which person, which class it would be. But to reduce the high school by four, by the equivalent of four full-time teaching positions uh, would be a combination of merging some classes to larger classes and reducing an elective choice uh, or two. Uh, we would, I wouldn't want to say which one that would be yet. We want to wait until we have final numbers and then we go ahead and of course we have to do all of this by April 15th so that if we're going to have a reduction in force we have to let people know. Uh, so we don't start with those details. Uh, we, we get there. Um, um, question as you're going along. Mm -hmm. When we reduce an, an elective, mm -hmm. generally what that means is that the population in the non-elective classes is going to go up because we have to accommodate the students who would have been there, is that right. correct? Right, or other electives. So if there's an elective that has 15 students that are taking and you know, that's a class that they love, it's also a class that they need, we have to provide 990 hours of education for the students. So if we cut that class, those students will take another elective course and that will increase the enrollment in the other classes. That's why I said it's a combination of merging classes and reducing choices for students. Uh, regarding uh, special education, uh, Lori Farkas and the principals have been working very hard together um, looking at what, in what ways we can streamline the services we provide, but also to try to build the programs, build the strength of the programs we have that will keep students in our district so that we can give them the services they need to stay in the neighborhood school and not have to go out of district. So that's a fine balance of efficiency of our staff while also strengthening what we can provide for our families. Stephanie, just to answer one of your questions, I know in last year's budget uh, book, uh, we had five open choice kindergarten positions and we filled all five, so that was it. It's five.
guidance you need. Not, uh, <laughs> well, no one's offered me a check for a million dollars to support the budget. <laughs> um, short of that, I do, um, I guess I, I heard what Vice Chair Zahowski said about kindergarten. I didn't hear that from the rest of the committee. I think the information I'm getting from the rest of the committee is that you would rather I move forward without the kindergarten fee. I mean, I would like the all team to do, I mean, you all have looked at this hard as a group and figured out what you think is best. I mean, I'm not in favor of the kindergarten fee, but I think I would leave it to you to, to decide what you think is best looking at the whole district, what you need to do. That would be my guidance. Mine, I would like, I, like I said, I'd like to see the, the, the number, you know, the, 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 the sum there at the end, see what went into it so that I could feel that it was a more reliable estimate. I don't know whether it's high or low right now, because I don't really know. If we, I mean, to me, it just looks like sort of half of what you could get if everybody paid 3000 roughly speaking. And um, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's some other costs in terms of, I don't know, state reimbursement. I believe we get a per student reimbursement for kindergarten. And I and I don't know what the effect of this would be on that. And, um, and I and, and then just sort of trying to think about, no, I, don't, I don't see any other sources of income coming from it, but I do see that number getting smaller just on this sort of the back of the envelope kind of thinking that I'm doing. So I'd like to, I'd like to see some more of those, the estimates that go into the estimate okay. um, before I would say whether to take it out or leave it in. <coughs> I, I just, I mean, I think in terms of education, the impact of losing that time is significant. I don't support it for that reason. I'm also, um, you know, we're picking from the worst of all alternatives, but just looking at the sliding scale for tuition, the state's state median income, they set it for the fiscal year 13, for a family of four making $60,000 would get a 50% discount of the tuition. So. And again, because of this discrepancy between keying things to state median income, we all know that the eastern part of the state, the median incomes are high, and even Northampton has a relatively low median income compared to what I think people perceive. I'm really wondering whether we're going to realize this. And, and that's bad for two reasons. One, because we're doing something that is not educationally sound, and then we're hoping to realize revenue that's not going to be there. And so that means going forward, the hole is even deeper mm -hmm. next year. So I guess I can't say that um, it's hard to oppose anything when you look at the alternatives and when the cuts get up into the double digits. You're talking about cutting 10% of a talented teaching staff. Um, so I would ask that you do both, <laughs> which I know, I mean, again, it's, it's, it's for me, um, I really don't want to see this happen, but you might present me with an alternative if I said I don't want it to happen at the next meeting, it seems worse. worse. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a question on the um, high school busing back to that, the 47,000, would that be um, actualized, actual realized costs, I mean, back at us? We, we, we can figure that out, 47000 that we currently have now. Is that where that's coming from? Well, we'd be able to reduce, <laughs> reduce those routes. Mm -hmm. And again, that will be factored into our bus contract, which is either out to bid right now or going out to bid right now. Uh, and we're estimating again that we would reduce the cost of the overall <coughs> 47000 And you also have to realize that that number of kids won't be paying a bus fee. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, I was asking. That so includes once that. Again, yes, a conservative estimate. Of okay. That. Right. So that's both. All right. Thanks. Other uh, questions or discussion? Is there just any good news that you've heard at all from the state <laughs> coming our way of uh, moving targets <laughs> that we can us. count on, or anything, or <laughs> some groundswell locally to get some movement to get revenue going? Um. So, you know, I think we talked a little bit about the, um, the governor's budget when I did my presentation. Um, he actually put out interactive maps, which if you want to go look at the 69,000 we're getting depicted on a map, you can go look at it. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, again, that's his chapter 70. I will say I, um, I attended a meeting, um, uh, what day was that? Uh, the days all blend together. I think it was, um, it was yesterday, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure it's yesterday. Uh, exactly. Um, uh, and it was with a Speaker of the House. Um, and it seems, you know, the governor's proposing $2 billion in new revenue. Um, and, you know, this was sort of a closed door meeting with mayors. And uh, suffice it to say, I don't think we're going to see $2 billion in new revenue. Um, and there's going to be changes. Uh, what I don't under what I don't know is is that going to mean uh, is that going to be better for us or worse for us? Frankly, you know, I don't think the governor's budget is great for us. I mean, it, well, I need to temper that because there is some really good stuff around um, transportation funding and some of those other issues. Um, but but um, so we'll have to see what it whether or not there's whether the I mean, what just played out kind of quietly. Um, over the last several months, you know, the governor made 9C cuts, um, which were, you know, somewhat modest, but, you know, mid-year budget cuts, to, and, and they were, some of them were at local aid or were to, you know, cities and towns. Um, the, the legislature in January basically overrode that, and they, they went into the rainy day fund, and, you know, it was, it was not, again, not, we're not talking a huge amount of money, but they basically sent a signal to the governor that we're not going to allow these cuts to local aid, and um, and so you know my hope is that more of that revenue, which they've realized, I mean you know they're they're showing about a 3.9 percent increase in revenue for the state, that more of that will be shared with cities and towns, um, you know, and I think that you know the speaker was saying all the right things. Of course, he was in a room full of mayors. Um, um, although you know he used to be a selectman, so he he um, I think he gets it. So you know our hope is that the house budget is going to take um, you know is probably going to scale things back and 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 focus be less complex and hopefully there'll be more local aid. Again, I I don't think it's going to be on the order that we're talking about, but it could help. It could help uh, um, some of these cuts. Uh, in terms of on the city side, you know, you know, I look at your seventy-seven thousand dollar gap, and again, we're we're asking you to we're asking you know departments to create level funded budgets. I already know, though, in the back of my mind, I'm asking you to do that, but I've got a gap still of about three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand um, dollars. So, you know, and I'm having meetings with you know uh, all the departments, and we're talking about layoffs in individual departments, you know, police officers, city staff, et cetera, um, to achieve those numbers. So you're right. It's a revenue issue. I mean, it's, it, that's, you know, the bottom, that's the issue when you won't, we, you know, we're going to get about 1.3 to 1.4 million in new revenue. Um, we already know that, you know, healthcare and pensions and all the other kind of costs that are, you know, we're going to, that's going to be gone. Um, so, I don't have I don't have a lot of um, good news to report on that front. Um, I haven't heard much discussion about um, new revenue sources. Uh, if you're talking about like override or something like that, I mean, again, it's it's difficult in the environment where there's new taxes being proposed at both the state and the federal level to then propose taxes at the local level. Um, you know, but you know, I, I'm I'm going to be going out into the city. Uh, this, I guess I can't say this month yet, but tomorrow I can say this month, March, uh, uh, and I'm going to be doing seven or eight budget hearings, and we're going to be talking about the, this challenge, and I want to hear from what citizens want, and part of that's going to be talking about the challenges, you know, in every department, schools, et cetera, and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what people want us to try to do in this situation, so... So other questions or comments? Um, so if, if not, then is there any new business items for this evening? I'm I just, uh, this just happened today, but the City Council School Committee Conference Committee will be sending a recommended or a recommendation that we've been talking a lot about new revenue. 
that we move forward with a resolution, as would the City Council, to support a number of current measures that are going on in Boston to raise revenue at the state level. So that will be at the next, next meeting. So in terms of future meetings and business dates, um, there's a rules and policy subcommittee scheduled for March 11th, uh, uh, a joint budget property school council meeting on Tuesday, March 5th, and then we'll be reconvening as a school committee on Thursday, March 14th. Um, I would now entertain a motion Move to, to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The meeting is adjourned.